of Revelation 18, verse 4, come out of her, my people, and asking the question, well, why does the Bible say come out of her? Now, we've covered that, or give the answer to that several times by reading that verse, but we really haven't dealt too much with the, the latter end of this, this whole subject, and that's what we hope to do this particular talk. But you need to remember where we've been. And uh, the very first talk was to talk about the foundation. And we've had to come back to that several times to illustrate that if the foundation is not based on what the Bible says, and you allow that uh, you're going to base what you believe on, on uh, what other people have said, groups of people, single people, uh, you know, famous students or whatever, if it's considered to be of equal authority with the Bible, then you do really get into the same problem that God's telling people now to get out of, it has been for, for centuries, to come out of her, my people. So the, the foundation is so important to make sure that what you believe and where you uh, worship your God is related to what you find in the scriptures. And as the the knowledge of the Bible and the reading of the Bible dwindles all around us and in the world we live in, we might guess that unless we put energy into this and set aside time preciously for this and, and are, you know, in the company of people who talk about it, the chances is that they will just be overwhelmed by the world, just overwhelmed by it. With all the media and all the way in which we communicate with each other, uh, the Bible just won't get read. That has to be a desire of ours, a determination of ours, to read the Bible to ensure that our base is what God has said and not what people are saying. And uh, we've talked a little bit about the reasons why on the, on the way through. So we, we looked at the Bible, and the key prophecy was Daniel 2. That image that King Nebuchadnezzar saw and that Daniel was able to explain to him the significance of it and how in explaining the significance of it, uh, his life was spared and so was the life of his friends. In fact, of all the wise men of Babylon because uh, up until that time, there was nobody that could tell King Nebuchadnezzar what this dream meant. And when we looked at the significance of it, well, it, it's, it's uh, laying out human history from God's viewpoint. You wouldn't find that in too many school textbooks. You wouldn't find that in too many commentary or, uh, commentaries. Uh, they're even talking about the Word of God. That that's comes from a study of what God sees when he sees human behavior. With a Babylonian head, then the Persians, then the Greeks, then the Romans, and then something Roman continuing right down into the feet, the time and where God actually strikes the image and sets up his kingdom. And what we've been trying to say through this is you trace the iron. You trace what was Roman in the first century and what has been true all the way through to our day. And you don't have to do anything other than just read the titles on certain buildings, probably in this city. I don't know if there are really uh, Roman Catholic churches in this city, but they say it's Roman Catholic church. Well, there you are, you see, it's Roman. And if it's Roman, it's iron. <coughs> And that's putting it right in front of our faces that what the Bible's been talking about for 2,500 years is current today. And then we, we went into the subject that the Pope has been talking about. It's been in the press. People who've been turning on their TV or listening to the radio or, or reading the newspaper couldn't help but see that the Pope came to, to honor one of uh, the Roman Catholics and make him a saint. And we did a little study on that to see whether this was possible because the Roman Catholics believe they can talk to saints that are in heaven. But the Bible says that nobody goes to heaven, that we die, and that apart from the resurrection, we never are alive again. And you can see a major departure in belief, depending on whether you're Roman Catholic and, and believe in the immortal, immortal soul, like many other Protestant churches do, or whether you believe what the Bible says that we are waiting for the resurrection. And so people who believe this look forward to seeing people, their ancestors, their mothers, fathers, grandfathers, grandmothers, who believe these things are looking forward to seeing them again because we are guaranteed that resurrection. 
to judgment, but resurrection. And after judgment, then the rewards of whether uh, we have done what's right or whether we have done what's wrong. And in our next talk, you'll remember that we, we went through the evolution of Catholic teaching. And we illustrated that when you build immortal souls onto the base of equal authority between you know, the church's position and the Bible's position, and you allow for an immortal soul, you build a very different set of beliefs. Because with the immortal soul, you have to put somebody somewhere as soon as they die. So for a Catholic, judgment occurs immediately upon that death. So either they go to heaven, or they're going to go to hell, or they're going to go to purgatory. And based on that, for centuries they've taught these things. Whereas what we believe the Bible teaches is that if you die, you won't be judged until you're raised. You have to be raised if you've died, raised to life again to stand before the judge. And then you will be re rewarded, not to go to heaven, but to this kingdom which Jesus taught when he went about teaching the good news of the kingdom, which we did not hear, did not see, and did not read about with respect to the Pope, the supposed leader of the Christian church. He had nothing to say about the good news of the gospel of the coming kingdom. We talked last evening about the family because this really, for the Catholics, was a celebration of the family, an institution that Pope John Paul II started and which is very advantageous for the Roman Catholic Church because it gets them to talk about something which everybody's interested in. Everybody's interested in the family. We all come from families. But unfortunately for the Catholic Church, the word family is, is tangled up a lot today because people don't know what a family is. They don't know whether a family is a, is a mother and a father and children or whether it's two fathers and children or two mothers and children or whether there's three involved in it, as some have suggested. So it's a little hard for the Pope to step through this. And we tried to show you that if you look at the Catholic Church uh, catechism, you would find that even he's in trouble with his church. And some of the news commentators picked this up, that he is not really talking what Catholic teaching has been over the years. But he's Pope, you see, so he has the ability to, to make these changes. Because when he speaks ex cathedra, he speaks infallibly. Now, we never talked about that one, but we don't need to. We, we did talk about 24 characteristics which would illustrate that what the Bible's speaking of when it talks about coming out of her, there isn't any other. There's no other institution, no other organization that comes close to meeting that standard as the Roman Catholic Church does. Now, when we look at what we're dealing with today, we had Isaiah chapter 2 read because that's a beautiful chapter. You could hardly imagine that anybody who wanted to talk about the kingdom wouldn't start here or in its uh, corresponding uh, prophecy in Micah or in some of the Psalms, that there is this vision of the future. Now, this is how beautifully it's set out in verses 2 and 3 of chapter 2 of Isaiah. It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord, or Yahweh's house, shall be established in the top of the mountains, exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of Yahweh, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. Now, that's why we, we set Jerusalem and Rome at odds with one another, because it's not going to be from Rome. I'm sure that many Roman Catholics would, would like to see this, that the world would be governed from Rome, but clearly you don't find any passages like that in the Bible. It, it says Jerusalem. And it says a lot more things about Jerusalem, where this is where God has placed his name. This is the place that God loves. He's chosen it. And it will be a wonderful time when people will want to go up to Jerusalem to learn of God. I can't imagine anything being nicer for a teacher than students coming in wanting to learn. Imagine that if you're a teacher. Your kids all came in with their books. They all sat down, got all their books out, pencils ready, and just looked at you, teach me. And it doesn't happen that way. But this is a little vision of getting a lot closer to it. And it says, come you. People will say, come ye, let's go up to the mountain of Yahweh, to the house of the God of Jacob, 
and he will teach us of his ways and we'll walk in his paths. Some big things got to happen to this world for that to take place. We're not close to even looking at that as in prospect in any way yet. So there's a lot got to happen. So the Pope has made his splash. He's come and uh, he's gone. And, you know, people will talk about this for some time to come, but he, he won't be too moved by it because he's going to be going on to many other countries. He's going to follow the pattern of John Paul II, who went to over 100 countries while he was, uh, uh, was Pope and being able to go to countries and try to build up the Catholic Church. Well, Catholic Church get pretty powerful. If a lot of those things which have been obstacles for people, this problem with marriage laws, this problem with abortion, this problem with homosexuals, if, if those laws are just relaxed, as this present Pope would seem to be doing, in creating a, a year of mercy where priests are allowed to forgive something they couldn't before, that could really change the attitude of a lot of people who would come back to the church and would see this man as a, as a leader who could possibly just take the world to a time of peace. And for Bible students, that's significant. Now, we looked at this book, and uh, I suggested to you that, you know, it wouldn't be a bad idea to see if you could find a copy. I don't think books like this are written anymore. We did check on Amazon. We found that there are books available. The, the new book could cost you quite a lot of money. But old books can be found for a reasonable price. To find that book and just see the number of links between old Babylon, that's the Babylonians at the time of the, of the children of Israel, and the modern Babylon. Now I'm going to take you through a little bit of that because it's, it's maybe a little difficult sometimes to see why we would still call it Babylon. If, the, if Babylon is gone, then why is there another Babylon? Well, there must be some reason for it because God says there would be. Now, I've already quoted this slide and I'll, I'll already illustrated to you when they were talking about making saints that this was just something that was practiced in ancient Babylon. Same ideas. I wanted to do that just to illustrate to you that that's what I mean when you've got a modern-day Babylon. They're practicing things that were practiced a long, long time ago. Why would any Christian religion want to pick up something that God condemned in the Bible? I mean, that's the startling part about it. Like, what do they think they're gaining by this? And there's a lot of answers in history. When you think of Constantine, Constantine's the key person here because... When he decided to declare himself a Christian, one of the ways in which he learned that he could consolidate uh, his empire was to get a little bit of uh, Greek mythology, a little bit of the ancient way Romans uh, met and believed, and in all these, get them all together. Get a little bit out of this, a little bit out of that, and put them together so everybody's happy. That idea has never lost sight of People still think that's the way to bring people together. Give them a little bit. Give these people a little bit. Make them so that they don't worry to mind too much what they don't like about each other, and we'll all be happy. That's the idea of ancient Babylon. But the Bible says that this Babylon that Jeremiah was contemporary with in his 51st chapter, verses 63, 64, it says, it shall be, when thou hast made an end of reading this book, this is to Jeremiah, that thou shalt find, bind a stone to it, cast it into the midst of the Euphrates. And thou shalt say, thus shall Babylon sink and shall not rise from the evil that I will bring upon her. And they shall be weary. Thus far are the words of Jeremiah. So would you expect Babylon to rise again? Like, how do you read it? Thus shall Babylon sink and shall not rise from the evil that I will bring upon her. That's what God's saying. So you see, a Bible student's going to answer this question. That if what God said to Jeremiah about this ancient Babylon, that it was going to sink and it would never rise again, how is it that the Bible in the New Testament speaks about Babylon? And we don't like to duck these things. We never like to duck, never duck anything. Like never just say, oh, I don't want to talk about that because I can't answer the question. You try to answer the question because you know that 
All of the advantages to us are in understanding and, and, and looking at this with light on it. Well, there was a man who tried to build Babylon again. And some of you would remember this. 1990, Saddam Hussein, president of Iraq, decides to rebuild Babylon. Now, he got a long way into it. He spent millions and millions. That's a big palace there. You can see on the screen uh, in the forefront of where the old ruins are, right beside the old city of Babylon. And he built this huge palace there. And uh, he was going to be Nebuchadnezzar too. In fact, that's the billboards that you could see around Babylon, where he, uh, in, the, in the cities of Iraq, where uh, Saddam Hussein was uh, in control. And uh, I was just made this little note on here. It was on a billboard near the ruins of Nineveh. Saddam celebrates the fall of Jerusalem with Salah Adon and Nebuchadnezzar. He was in the act of rebuilding Babylon in May 1990. So there you see the two other characters, Nebuchadnezzar and this other Arab leader whose name was Salah Adon and uh, Nebuchadnezzar. And, and here's Here's uh, Saddam Hussein. He's going to be Nebuchadnezzar too. And he had all these bricks made, millions of bricks with his stamp on them. So the people, centuries, he thought, later on would discover how great he was. Oh, if you're a Bible student and you see this, you know there's trouble ahead. The Bible says it won't be rebuilt. And here's a man saying, I'm going to rebuild it. Would you stick your neck out and say he won't achieve it? Well, I mean, we could say that now, couldn't we? <laughs> because it's all over. We know what happened. But you know, that's the way the Bible is. When the Bible says something won't happen, it doesn't happen. So he started to do it. Was he going to succeed in it? Well, you may have seen that picture on the left. He was a pretty handsome looking man at one time. But when they captured him, they took him out of the ground. He was hiding in an underground place. And he succumbed to hanging in 2006. And that was the end of that dream. And Babylon went back to ruins. You don't beat the Bible. It's 2,500 years ago these prophecies were made, but they will be fulfilled. And for a man who tried to rebuild Babylon, it didn't happen. But still, you see, we got an old Babylon and we got a new Babylon, so we still got to figure this out. In Jeremiah 51, as we read it, verse 64 there, Thus shall Babylon sink and shall not rise from the evil. But in Revelation 18, a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone, cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. It's going to happen again. Now, can you see the dilemma a Bible student's in? The Bible said this would never happen. Babylon would never be built again. Saddam Hussein tried to do it, and he couldn't. And yet this prophecy in Revelation 18 says that that great city Babylon shall be thrown down. So what city are we talking about? You've got to look at this figuratively. And it's really interesting because in, in one of the works, I, I tried to find this slide, but I, I couldn't find it with the authority of where I got it from. I don't like doing that. I don't like giving you any, any information where I can't show you where I got it from because it's not me. I don't want to impress you with what I'm saying. I, I don't mind impressing you with what other people have said. But I do remember reading that because Peter, they couldn't find anything in the Bible that ever mentioned that Peter was in Rome, and yet the Catholics believe he was buried in Rome, uh, they had to figure out some way to explain this. And the way they did it was through Peter, the epistles to Peter. And it's really, really quite clever how they did this. Because if you have a look at 1 Peter chapter 5, which is the end of the first epistle, and at verse 13, it says, The church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you, and so doth Marcus my son. Now people had been playing with this because they had this, this idea that uh, there was so much of ancient Babylon in Rome that there was a lot of similarities because the, the, the the, the city was just full of images, full of things that originated in ancient Babylon. The people used to be thinking of Rome as Babylon. And then the, the Catholics got a hold of this, and they saw that Peter was writing from Babylon. And the, and the 
the writing I tried to get a hold of, because I did find it, and I, I did record it, but I, I just lost where I, I put that. The Catholics were saying that this illustrated that Peter was at Rome, because everybody knows that Babylon is Rome. Uh, that's quite an interesting quote to have. I guess I'm going to find that somewhere. I know it's in my, in my uh, library somewhere, but I just can't put my finger on it. That is one of the reasons how the Roman Catholics themselves believe that they could make Babylon the city of Rome. So this, for them, is really referring to Rome. Now this is where it gets a bit exciting. And this is going to be a bit of a roller coaster from here on in because we're going to be moving into different areas. But I wanted to try to bring you up to speed with some of the things that are happening in um, the world as well as some of the uh, doctrinal points which are being argued in the world. So we go back to Ezekiel 38. This is a, this is a really key chapter. And I, I think that Brother Jonathan will be talking about this next week because uh, you can hardly leave Ezekiel 38 out. It's so much of it is what's going on in the world today. And I just think that is just so remarkable that a, a chapter like Ezekiel 38 with all those nations mentioned in it can all be identified today uh, in, this, in the sense of where the people were. And they're all on the stage. Like Iran's on the stage. Egypt's on the stage. Libya's on the stage. And, and uh, Syria's on the stage. All these countries on the world stage in these days, right out of Ezekiel 38. Really an important chapter to look at. So the timing of this chapter is very important. <clears throat> and this verse gives you the timing. After many days thou shalt be visited. In the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword, gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste, but is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely. All of that prophecy couldn't have happened before 1948. So we just happen to be the privileged generation. Like there's, there's a number of generations here in the room. But all of us, in a sense, are able to witness this because it's recent. That Israel has recently come out of the nations, gathered out of the people. That's a characteristic of these people. They still keep on coming into Israel from nations where the Jews are being persecuted. And they come, against, they come into Israel, which is a land which has been always uh, waste, but is now brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. We're still looking a little bit as as to what that really means by dwelling safely. But it, it at least means dwelling confidently, and that's one of the things that we could say is characteristic of the people today. Now, Gog of the land of Magog, I am, I'm having to move through this a little faster than maybe we, we ought to, but as I say, uh, Brother Jonathan's going to fill in all these. I'm sure he would. <laughs> You're going to have a pleasure listening to him next weekend on this subject. But this is, comes out of Elpas Israel, and it's a really an interesting citation because Elpas Israel was, was the publication that brought to the people's attention, that read it, that this was, um, uh, this was involving or going to involve Britain. And the way John Thomas could foresee this in Bible prophecy is almost exactly the way it happened. If you want some interesting reading, you want to go back to the Herald of the Kingdom of the Age to Come by John Thomas in 1852 to 1854. Because you can imagine that Elpo's Israel had been out a couple of years. And, and during those times in his periodical, he was getting information from people all around uh, America here. And America w wasn't too easy to get around back in the 1850s. But one of the things that really surprised me and uh, I've never really been able to get much deeper in it than what I could find in his, in his writing, is a man wrote to him, and he said, I am just so happy to read Apples Israel. He said, I've done all my studies, and he says, somebody agrees with me. Now, could you imagine that? That back in the 1850s, that someone had done independent study of John Thomas, and in terms of prophecy, had said, I am just so happy to read your publication and that you agree with me. But what is even more astonishing, this man's name was Jude Barassa, and he was a Potawatomi Indian. And you think, where did these Indians ever get 
the information from to understand prophecy so well that a man could say that? Well, you couldn't dispute it. Here was the letter. This was the man. That was the tribe he came from. And uh, the Potawatomi Indians has been of interest of mine for a long time to try to figure out how they managed to get the information to, to uh, be able to determine that. Oh, God calls people from all walks of life. You know, it might be people we're trying to reach here and, you know, they're just not listening. But there's other people in other parts of the country, maybe even here, but they're listening at a, at a different level and, and, and being attracted to it. So that's a little bit of insight to John Thomas's work. But what I wanted to get to was what's on the slide here. Gog of the land of Magog. That is, styling the ruler of Magog by the latter syllable of the name of the country over which he rules. We have seen that Magog is the region extending from the Ros or Russia to the Rhine, comprehending Wallachia, Transylvania, uh, Hungary, and Germany. Of course, the prophecy must be future because the prince of Rosh is the Gog of Magog. And as yet, no emperor of Russia has been also emperor of Germany, etc. Now, Christadelphians have to be careful here because sometimes we look at Putin and think, oh, this man, he's going to do everything. Look at him. Look at what he's doing. But Elpis Israel is true to the scriptures. He was to be Gog of the land of Magog. And when we look at those old maps, I think I actually got one here for you. You look at those old maps and we look at where Gog and Magog was. It, it wasn't strictly in Russia. There may look like those boundaries weren't distinct in those days. It's going back to the Genesis of Genesis 10, people were migrating back and forth. But there's been general agreement that the sons of Japheth, the son of Noah, went north and they went into Europe. And so these sons that are in this chapter, Japheth, Gomer, Magog, Meshech, Tubal, all names coming right out of Ezekiel 38. And historians tell us that they went north and they went into the area of Russia, they went into the area of Germany, they went into the area of France. We have got to see Europe and Russia come together. Now, they're not together. They're even at odds with one another. But there's one reason why they, they can't be too independent of one another, because Russia needs to sell its gas and, and Europe needs the gas. And isn't it interesting that where the gas is found is, is where God knew he could bring nations together, not the least of which is now the eastern end of the Mediterranean, which is just a huge resource for Egypt, for Lebanon, for, for Syria, for Israel, all those nations. There may be some real squabbling over that, but the problem is that uh, sometimes we miss this. Europe has got to be united, and Russia has got to be the leader. That's not happened yet, but as Bible prophecy goes, just give it time. So even the historians tell us in that little description up there in the top left, the descendants of Gomer occupied probably Germany, France, Spain, and the British Isles. So they saw them spreading all over Western Europe. And they are the nations that will be with Russia when they come down uh, into the Middle East area. Well, we did rise, or we did go through a period of time when Russia looked like they were out of it. Uh, I can never forget that period. It was just sort of like a bit of a disappointment. Through the 50s, we see these gigantic bombs being developed, you know, enough to destroy life all over many times, all life on earth, many times. Why would nations ever be so silly, so mad, as, as they, they described it, to ever want to do that? But, you know, one nation's got it, the other nation wants to have it, so they, they're, you know, it's, it's mutual deterrent. And then another nation has it, and then another nation has it, so they're, they're now worried about atomic weapon proliferation around the world, and they're still worried about that. And the weapons are still there. They haven't gone away. But then when Russia sort of just fell apart, we thought maybe something was wrong in our interpretation, but it sure didn't take long to get rising again. And now we see Russia really putting a lot of money into their armaments. You know, Russia loves to terrorize people, like they really do. They fly these airplanes, these bombers. Like they're not, they're not uh, civilian aircraft. These are military aircraft and they fly them on your border and they fly up around your border to scramble the jets to see if you can get up and intercept them you see and they won't come over your border but they come right up to the border and i understand on july 4th that a few of them 
came to America off the coast of California. They came up there oh, just to say, you know, hello on July the 4th. Military planes? What if somebody made a mistake? I mean, that's really foolish to play with that kind of fire. But that's what Russia is up to. One of the things, I don't have a slide, I don't go at that direction with this talk, but one of the things that I wanted to talk about this man, this uh, Vladimir Putin, president of Russia, he's got the character of the man that we expect will rise in Russia. And uh, one of the things that they have done was required by the Bible. I just draw your attention to this. If you turn back to Ezekiel 38, it's, uh, it's really quite an interesting, uh, it's, it's an interesting prophecy because it, it talks about them coming up from the land of the north and uh, out of the north parts. Uh, just uh, verse 15. Thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company and a mighty army. Now, it's, it's pretty obvious if you have a globe and you have Jerusalem and you have Moscow, that Jerusalem and Moscow are almost in the same line. But keep going. If you keep going north of Moscow, eventually on those lines all come to the North Pole. Guess who's claimed the North Pole? The Russians sent a submarine to the North Pole underneath the Arctic ice. And with a robotic vehicle, they went out and they placed a Russian flag right on the North Pole. So in terms of the Bible, coming from the uttermost part of the north, there is no other nation to compete with Russia. They got a flag there already. Not that they own it, but they got a flag there. That's the spirit of the people. They're prepared to push the limits, and this is the man. That's what we see of him. Like, who would like to have that kind of a grand entrance on anything? You come in, and the cameras are flashing, and you got people standing there at attention, and you walk in in your suit, and there's this sort of wealthy look behind you. But look who else is in the picture. Now these are old pictures because this is a more of a modern phenomenon. If you know uh, that man up on the top left, that's Lok Wenza. He was the man uh, in Poland who was uh, very much influenced by Pope John Paul II. And they were in their ability together along with President Reagan. We show you him in the bottom here. They were able to overthrow communist Poland. Communism died out of Poland. Poland changed. They didn't change with warfare. They changed because of the power of the church in that country. And I think Putin listened. I think he did. Because we see a big change. But this, this works so well on the world stage that now you see the Pope meeting world leaders all over the place. Like many people have said before, why would anybody want to meet the Pope? Like how many missiles has he got? How many guns? What, what's the size of his army? Why would anyone want to meet the Pope? Like when you sit down and you think about it, in terms of what these nations do, they really are sitting there because of the, of the relative strength of one another. So you meet a person because uh, you, know, you feel you've got, you got something you can bargain with, that uh, we, we would like you to do this because we don't want you doing that. But why would they meet with the Pope? He just happens to be a very, very influential person. If he's in your country, and he's got churches through your country, he's got people through your country. He's got priests through your country. And if he's got priests in your country, and they have churches all over the place, the people are confessing to the Pope. He probably knows more about your country than the leaders of the government do because of the way he has contact with the everyday person. Very, very influential. And you can understand why Russia has learned that this is the way to get a hold of the people, is to get, get them through religion. And so what was not working in communism now appears to be working uh, in, in uh, the political parts of the world. Now, I needed to do this because you need to know this. This is a little diversion, but as I said, it's a bit of a rough ride going through all these different things. You need to know what replacement theology is. And if you ask the question, what is replacement theology uh, on these you know, questions on the uh, internet, it would say this is uh, supersessionism, which otherwise this is the answer. Replacement theology, also known as supersessionism, essentially teaches 
that the church has replaced Israel in God's plan. Adherents of replacement theology believe the Jews are no longer God's chosen people and God does not have a specific future plan for the nation of Israel. Well, you might never have known that because we don't usually hear that word the replacement theology or, or supersessionism, but that's a very important <coughs> teaching because if people believe that the Jews are out of the picture, that they're not in God's plan, they won't be paying much attention to Ezekiel 38. You got to be thinking it must mean some other time period in history. They either put it in the future, they put it in the past, or they just discount it altogether. So people who have bought into this, and there's a lot of Christian denominations have bought into this, are not with us as Christadelphians on this. This is what the Catholic position is. The church prepared for in the Old Covenant. The church prepared for in the Old Covenant. The remote preparation for this gathering together of the people of God begins when he calls Abraham and promises that he will become the father of a great people. Its immediate preparation begins with Israel's election as the people of God. By this election, Israel is to be the sign of the future gathering of all nations. But the prophets accuse Israel of breaking the covenant and behaving like a prostitute. They announce a new and eternal covenant Christ instituted this new covenant. Do you think they believe in replacement theology? I think they do. But you see, it's important not to be too clear because you benefit by making things a bit mysterious. Just, just let people wonder about it, but don't be too clear. But I believe that the Catholic Church does not see Israel in the Bible as having any place at all. So it really presents a problem looking at prophecy because if you buy into this, and a lot of churches do, because you look at this one, uh, here's replacement theology from a different view altogether. This book is, uh, this building is in Brooklyn. Okay, the watchtower announcing Jehovah's kingdom. And what they say in their Jehovah's Witnesses publications is this, to make known to the people that Jehovah is the true and almighty God, therefore we joyfully embrace and and take the name which the mouth of the Lord God has named. And we desire to be known as and called by the name to wit Jehovah's Witnesses. And then they quote Isaiah 43. But Isaiah 43 cannot be bent that way. Now, I don't want to take the time to, to show you uh, the details of it. But Isaiah 43 is about uh, God's Witnesses, the Jews. Look at, look at the little bit of detail we have here in just this verse 10. Well, I, I guess I got all three verses here. You are my witnesses, saith Yahweh, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am Yahweh, and beside me there is no Savior. I have declared and have saved and I have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore, ye are my witnesses, saith Yahweh, that I am God. You see, you've got to... Look at the way they are witnesses. They're not witnesses because they choose to be witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses, we would assume, choose to be witnesses. They go around knocking on our doors. They want us to become witnesses, Jehovah's Witnesses. So it's a choice of whether we do. But that's not what he means here because he says, You are my witnesses, saith Yahweh, that I am God. You don't witness it by being willing. You, you witness it by you do what I say and even if it's bad or good, it still will be what I have said because God gave promises and he gave, he gave things which would not turn out too well if, if they didn't. So that when we look at Jerusalem, we have to deal with all the prophecies about Israel. And here's one in Isaiah 52. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth there shall no more Come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake thyself from the dust. Arise, sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. God finished with the Jews. It doesn't look like it because it seems that he's going he's to still work with these people, even though they are and have rejected him and are in dispersion. So he's, he's looking at Jerusalem favorably in that prophecy. Well, in Joel chapter 3, this is what gives us, I think, uh, great reasons to be on the edge of, his, of our seats. 
It says, in the days, and in that time when I bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I'll gather all nations, bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat, and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. So God's saying he's going to gather the nations down into the valley of Jehoshaphat, which we can't be exactly certain where that is, but it would appear from other prophecies to be around Jerusalem. The nations will be brought to Jerusalem. Well, can you think of any reasons why nations would come to Jerusalem? Well, here's another one. In Luke 21, verse 24, Jesus said, with respect to Jerusalem, after you know, alluding to the fact that it would be brought down by another power, which turned out to be the Romans, that they would fall by the edge of the sword, they'd be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Like, not always. It wasn't replacement theology. It wasn't that God gave up the Jews and chose somebody else. God still has a work with the Jews. They'll be trodden down of the Gentiles until that time is complete. So it tells us that in the New Testament that Jerusalem was the center of the ecclesia. In Acts 15, verse 14, they came up to resolve the issues in Jerusalem. When they were come to Jerusalem, they, received, they were received of the church or of the ecclesia and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. That was the significance of Jerusalem at the beginning. Now, I mentioned this in an earlier talk that I'd actually show you this slide because uh, my wife and I went to Jerusalem just to... Uh, just to sort of walk around and, and see if we could find who would be the stakeholders. Who's the people that really have an interest in the city of Jerusalem? And, uh, you know, you learn a lot from publications. Sometimes the publications are only things you can buy in the city or in the land, but uh, certainly there's, there's a lot to be learned there. Big city, a lot of, a lot of buildings in, in Jerusalem. Like you can see the old city here defined by the walls. You can see the, the, uh, the, the mosque. And uh, you can see a few maybe of the, of the significant buildings uh, relating to uh, the Latin uh, church. So there's a Latin quarter there. There's an Arab quarter there. There's a Jewish quarter there. And there's a Greek quarter there. And that's how Jerusalem is divided up. So there's the stakeholders. Now who's behind those stakeholders? Well, the Latin quarter would be the Roman Catholic Church and Western Europe. All those countries would be interested from the Latin point of view of that Latin quarter. That's where the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is. They're interested in those, those ancient buildings and those ancient parts of the city. The Arab quarter, well, you don't dare touch that. You get members of, of, uh, of Jordan, of Saudi Arabia, of Iran, any of those Arab nations would be upset. You dare touch the Arab quarter. How about the Jewish quarter? Well, you'll upset the Jews all over the world if you, if you touch the Jewish quarter. Well, how about the Greek quarter? Ah, that's where Russia comes in. A very, very interesting little episode happened when, uh, when my wife and I went to uh, Jerusalem. We decided that we would go to the, uh, the Church of the Nativity, which is in Bethlehem. And to get into that church, you've got to go from, from Israel into Palestine. So you've got to go through a gate. You've got to go. So we, we had an Arab uh, driver who drove us there and when we got into this church it was uh, really an old old building nothing really beautiful too much about it at all except that you could see it was really ancient what surprised me was it hadn't burned down because it was just all wood you think it just some person you know foolishly or as people have been in there you know that's quite a history to that building but anyway all the action was underground so we we went underground we walked along this little tunnel and we came to a spot that was lit up and it was really not done very well but there's a big silver star there. And, you know, we're reading by some Arab leader, and he, he says, you know, this, this, this is where Jesus was born. Okay, this is where Jesus is born. And this is the Greek Orthodox Church telling us, this is where Jesus was born. And that's our territory. But, you know, if, if the star was here, and you turned around like this, over here is a manger. And in the, in the manger area, there's a cradle and there's a little doll in there, like a little baby in there. And the Latin church says, and that's where Jesus was laid. In the, and, and the Greek church 
and the, and the Latin church are, are touching each other underground. And for centuries, they have been at loggerheads with each other on this. In fact, it was pretty quite interesting to see that there were burn marks all the way down the tunnel, a scorch marks of some fire had been going through there. So that under, under the ground, things are, are sort of tender dry between the, the Greek and the Latin church. Now, things are changing. And I just wanted to make you aware that if you go to that old city, you almost see everything that Ezekiel 38 is talking about. You can see the nations that are talked about there right in the city. This is our area, and that's what we're defending. Russia? Well, look at this. Doesn't that look Russian? That's the Church of Mary Magdalene, just at the bottom of the Mount of Olives. That's Russian uh, Orthodox material. And... Uh, so Russia's got real estate right in Jerusalem, and they're interested in maintaining it and keeping it. And these holy sites have been fought over before, and they may very well figure in time to come as one of the reasons why we got all the nations so interested in Jerusalem. Now this is the picture which I mentioned a little earlier too. You got Putin side by side with religious leaders. That would not have happened in the communist era. Now when we look at Gorbachev, well, not Gorbachev, Khrushchev, Brezhnev. You know, some of those names that go back to the, those early days when those people were rattling their sabers and just sending little Sputniks over America and exciting all the Americans. Here's a little satellite going over and what's going to happen now? Like, these people got all these weapons. Or they got, have they got weapons on board that thing? And that was what spoofed the Americans into getting on to sending a man to the moon. So here's Putin now, side by side with uh, these leaders of the Russian Orthodox Church. Why is he siding up to these people? Well, I wanted to read you this because this is something I got out of the Snippets file. This is one of the benefits of the Snippets file. It's a file that's, that's sent out uh, probably once a week by Don Pierce from Rugby, England. And he surveys a number of magazines and he looks at what he thinks would be of interest to Christadelphians or people of Bible prophecy, and he'll send it to you. Very easy to get on his list. You get that every week. This has been the most valuable resource I've found. He says, when Putin came to power, or this is, this is the, uh, the, the Forbes magazine that's really saying this. When Putin came to power, he shrewdly noted the, Roman, uh, or the uh, Russian Orthodox Church useful uh, role in boosting nationalism and the fact that it shared his view of Russia's role in the world and began to work towards strengthening the church's role in Russian society. Now that's quite a, a sentence full right there. To tell you why Putin got into it, because he's the man. He shrewdly noted the church's useful role in boosting nationalism. So it was to his advantage to warm up to the church. Reading again where we left off, early in his presidency, the Russia, Russian Duma passed a law returning all church property seized during the Soviet era, era which alone made the Russian Orthodox Church one of the largest landholders in Russia. Over the past decade and a half, Putin has ordered state-owned energy firms to contribute billions to the rebuilding of thousands of churches destroyed under the Soviets. And many of those rich oligarchs surrounding him are dedicated supporters of the ROC who have contributed to the growing influence of the church in a myriad of ways. Around 25,000 Russian Orthodox churches have been built or rebuilt since the early 1900s, the vast majority of which have been built during Putin's rule and largely due to his backing and that of those of his close circle of supporters. So with all the saber rattling and all the military buildup and all the ships and all the aircraft and the troops and that, the, you know, the, invention or the, the intervention in, in, uh, in the Ukraine, this is going on behind the scenes, building up a relationship with the church. And I just wanted you to see that. That's how much has been going on in his time. Well, why? Why would Putin meet with the Pope? And why would the Pope meet with Putin? Like, what would they have in common? You might be able to understand why he would meet with the Western countries, but why would he meet with Putin? And you can see that we're seeing strange things happening in this world now. Even things that, uh, you know, shaking the, the catechism of the Roman church. 
that these people are taking liberties. They have the power. They're, they're, they're their own man. Both Putin and the Pope are their own man. They can do things that, that really there's no power to, to be accountable to. They, they can do them as they wish. And what are they up to? Well, that's the question. Well, just going back in, in way of sort of rounding out what we're, we're saying this weekend, uh, ladies and gentlemen and brothers and sisters, Jeremiah 51, verses 5 to 7. This was stated to the people in Babylon prior to its fall. It says, For Israel hath not been forsaken, nor Judah of his God, of the Lord or Yahweh of hosts, though their land was filled with sin against the Holy One of Israel. Flee out of the midst of Babylon. Deliver every man his soul. Be not cut off in her iniquity. For this is the time of Yahweh's vengeance. He will render upon her a recompense. Babylon hath been a golden cup in Yahweh's hand that made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine. Therefore the nations are mad. That was said about the Babylon that fell back in the time of Nebuchadnezzar. But look at the similarities. He's telling his people to get out of Babylon. Why? Well, you deliver your soul. Because if you don't, you'll be cut off in her iniquity. That's almost identical to what we read in, in Revelation chapter 18. Because God's going to judge that nation for what it's done to his people and to the nations at large. The nations have drunken of her wine, therefore the nations are mad. So Revelation 18, verse 4, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partaker of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. So the Babylon of old is gone long since. Now, Saddam Hussein tried to rebuild it, but the Bible said it would never be rebuilt. So this new Babylon is Babylon in another sense. And it's not on the site of Babylon that, that Nebuchadnezzar was trying to build, but it has the belief system. It has many of its ideas come right out of that ancient civilization that was against the teachings of God. Well, no, it won't be Rome that's exalted. It will be Jerusalem. So Psalm 48 verses 1 and 2 says, A song and psalm for the sons of Korah. Great is Yahweh, greatly to be praised in the city of our God in the mountain of His holiness. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion. On the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Or again in Psalm 122, the song of degrees. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is builded as a city that is compact together. Whither the tribes go up, the tribes of Yahweh, under the testimony of Israel, to give thanks unto the name of Yahweh. For there are set thrones of judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. So we've laid out for you these 24 characteristics, and I do suggest to you that that is not exhaustive. That is, there's, other, there's a number of other things we could add to that list that would illustrate to you that when God is speaking through all those prophets about this power that would be in existence at the time of the coming of the Lord, there is only one uh, particular organization on the world that comes anywhere close to what this says, and that is the Roman Catholic Church. The Bible says to everybody, come out of her, my people. Thank you.